up from Texas. Wyoming. Yeah, Wyoming, yeah. Montana and all up in there. Yeah, they went through all, I don't know how many thousand was in the bunch, but there was lots of herds that are good. It takes you maybe when the herd, they camped on the Palador, that's uh, the North Canadian here up there, you know, they call it the beaver there, or uh, yeah, the beaver. Well, it's this North Canadian. And we was right at the mouth of the Palador, it emptied into that. And that's where they, they crossed the river because there's a low bank, you see. Mm -hmm. And the cattle have to, they stay on the road for a day or two without water, they got to have water. Well, they have to string them out up and down that so they won't drown them. Just, well, they do. Pile they up on each they do. They pile up and drown a lot of them that way. Because they're all wanting water so bad, they just flock in. You've got to get the herd strung out like a big rope, you know, up and down the river. Yeah. Uh, so they can keep from drowning so many of them. Because they just trample them down and go right in. And they made that a bed ground, you know right east of our place. It was only about a quarter of a mile down there to where they made the bed ground. And then they stayed there till the next morning. And when they went to go and start out the next morning, I bet you it'd take right at, a, right at an hour for to get this trail by the house. Of course, they went on each side of the old sod house, you know. They just right up the river bottom, you know. Yeah. They followed the river as much as they could till they had to quit, you know, to cut across the divide. Mm, stay close to that water. They had to. They had to keep their stock. Yeah. And, and that's where... Water was a priceless commodity oh, in that country, wasn't it? Was it? It sure was. And especially you have a big herd that way, they had to have water. And they... They'd get them out and let them graze as much as they could while they was driving them. And at these bed grounds, there was always a bunch of calves left, you know, newborn calves. Well, some of the riders had come up to us. They called them nesters out there them days. Of course, we're just squatters on wherever you sat down. You didn't have no right to that land, but you did. That is yours. You occupied it. You occupied it, and that is yours. <laughs> well, they'd come up and tell us of a morning, there's a bunch of calves down there. Some of you people want them. We can't take them. We'll just leave them, which they did. Drove off and left them. Sometimes there'd be as many as 20, 30 head of calves there. And these farmers that had cows that they could milk, they taken these calves, and there's what you call a bucket calf. You had to feed him, you know. Mm -hmm. When we saved, we had, I think we had raised out of the bunch about 20, 20 some head. And, long horn. Yeah, them long horn calves, you know. And my uncle, and I think he had 25 or 30 head, some extra cows, you know, at this milk. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, he got a, quite a bunch, I don't remember the amount of calves that we'd got, but they got what they could, and them that they couldn't feed, they're just little fellas starved, you know. Yeah. No milk, you know, no nothing. And they got smart, and they made up of what they called a gruel. It was made from uh, old uh, cornmeal and stuff. Got made up of feed, you know, that they could eat, yeah. and cooked it, and uh, Fed that to them, you know, and they got a thin enough that they could get that down so the calves could eat it. And they soon learned to eat out of a bucket. Yeah. And they learned right, they did. I yeah. bet they were some rough characters coming <laughs> up the trail, them herds, wasn't Oh, it? they were that. All us, you know. There was they took a tough fellow to, to stand it. To well, they endured the trip. Endured the hardship. That's right, that. they had to. And they liked the old dark. But you Seven had... Seven days a week, probably, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, gosh, that, that lasted there about... I think it was right at a month that those cattle kept separating bunches, you know, to passing through. Mm -hmm. It would be about a month before they got them all, all these big herds that went up into the northwest there. 
Yeah, I got it, Anderson. Uh, Cap Hungate, I forget how many thousand he had. He was right south, southwest of Palidora, south and west of Palidora there on the beaver. In the good night, there was uh, north or south of uh, Beaver City. Good night's bunch. Over on Sand Creek and on Coon Creek. Little Sand or Creeks, you know, little ravines like all oh, bigger than this out here, you know. Mm -hmm. Running water, though. But there's no timber in that country much, only just on those creeks. And very little of that. Mm -hmm. No, we couldn't get. We used use cow chips and buffalo chips for what? For our fuel. And they would burn the stove out. Don't think they wouldn't. Burn the grates out of it in a short time. <laughs> mm -hmm. You wouldn't think it'd get that hot, would you? Mm -hmm. It did. And we fixed the way we saved our fuel for the cook with and for the winter. We've taken this, built a sod shanty right by the side of the house, you know, and we stacked those chips in there like you would wood. Stacked them in there to keep them out of the wet, you know, mm -hmm. snow and stuff for the winter. And we fed them out of there, but there's lots of these big centipedes you see. <laughs> yeah, I remember them. Yeah, you don't remember those, don't yeah. you? Well, that's what it was. There were a lot of them. What about a rattlesnake? Oh, good night. We didn't have any in our fuel house, by the way. But when gathering your chips, there's where you run onto them. Looks like, look like them dugouts have been a good place to... <laughs> for the right. and well, they were. They, they, uh, they, they didn't get in there like you would think they would. Now, we had uh, a sod... We lived in sod houses mostly on there. Or dugouts is up in the banks, you know, in the hills, like. And uh, these uh, sod houses, you had to leave your windows and all. Of course, we tried to get the windows and put in. We put old cloth or stuff up there over that opening for to keep the wind out and the cold and rain. And Father hung his coat in his new one that he had just built. He had never got no window in there, no frame or nothing. He hung his coat in there to keep the night air out. And the next morning, when he got up, he went to get his coat to put it on, and he jerked a big rattler out on his feet. It didn't happen to bite him. But my golly, he crawled up there during the night, and he was nested up in that coat. A big rattler. Them prairie rattlers, they're not very large. They're only all around two foot length, some of them longer. Well, how did them cowboys uh, uh, sleeping out on the prairie keep them from crawling in bed? With you them? know what they you, they found out that a hair rope, a rattler or a snake won't crawl across a hair rope, mm -hmm. and they'd throw that out around their bunk, you know. And by God, if that there kept him, kept the snakes out. The snakes didn't come in. They wouldn't crawl over that hair rope. That hair gets yeah. into that. Yeah, you know, yeah, some way into the. Oh, opening in their hides, you know, there. Yeah, I don't know. Scales, you know. scales, yeah, they're scaly, you know, a whole yeah, lot. Well, they won't cross it. They won't cross one. You can turn him, put a hair rope around him, and that fella stays in there. <laughs> he can't, he don't get out. What about uh, those trail herds and roundup had on them big ranches and all that in that country? Did uh, the truck wagon all went with them? Did they oh. have a tent or anything for any kind of shelter? No, well, just, just a covered uh, just a covered wagon. Covered wagon. Just a covered wagon. They never put up a tent. They all bedded on the ground, just out on the prairie that way. And you throw your saddle down and use it for a pillow. Take your blanket and spread it down there and use this saddle for a pillow and cover up with that blanket. Yeah, you know, it's slipping your clothes, pull your boots off sometimes to rest your feet. But the most of them is just slipping their clothes out of the way. Do they have to ride the herd of the night uh, like yeah. you see in these movies? You sure do. Before? You had you had men that worked run up till twelve o'clock at night 
And the way, do you know how to get the cattle bedded down? No. They turn in and get them in a bunch out of the way, and they ride around that and singing or something, or kind of a song, and they, they darn cattle all bed down, they go laying down. And after they all get laid down, then you don't have no trouble without somebody or something excites them, you know. And the, the uh, boys would work up, well, I forget how many they'd have on a shift, according to their bunches, that they'd have on a shift, you know, that way. And then they switched at 12 o'clock at night, and the other boys taking it up then on to daylight. And that's the way they... They make a long day for whoever oh, riding oh, on her. Oh, boy, how it does. It makes a long day for them. And I promise you right now that uh, when you stay up all night or half the night, you're going to get tired riding the next day. Yeah. And they have six horses. That's called a string. Each man has six of them Bronx to ride. And so there's none of them broke. Some of them now and then you'll find one that's well broke. But when you go saddle him up and go to get on him, you've got to ride, and you have to understand riding to ride him. <laughs> now they they pitch with I don't you. I can imagine they spent the time of breaking them nowadays as they do now, as oh, gentling them and all before they got on. They maybe. didn't then. They just taking him as he come, and they turned in and got them. Them boys got to where they they could ride them, and as a rule. The boys would tie their coat. They didn't have these saddles like they have nowadays with these leg horns out over each side mm -hmm. so as you can grip them a wide, right, wide swell. They'd turn in and take their coat and double it or slicker and tie across in front of your legs here, you see, to this, just lay it across there and tie mm -hmm. the string on each side. Well, your legs would catch you into that, you know, and that would help hold you when the horses are pitching. By God, that's the way it had to help him out in his ride. Yeah. But he always had his slicker on that darn saddle and his rope. And his, uh, as a rule, if he carried the Winchester, some of them carried Winchesters, but most of them just six-shooters. Few of them had Winchesters, Winchesters and six-shooters. But then Winchester, scabbard was on the side of that darn saddle fastened there so that you could get your Winchester in case you needed it. Some of them had them lengthways and some of them had them straight up and down by your stirrup, you know, by your leg. Yeah. The Winchester scabbard. But they was easy guy to hold of. They they for wild game is the Well, if they were, didn't get no wild game they'd kill a small beef. They'd kill a, a yearling. There's a fat that always pick out a good one, of course. And they always had plenty of meat, regardless. And I believe that's why that they were so healthy, that they used fresh meat all the time, you know. And they'd barbecue that, and sometimes fry it, either way they get to it, as long as they had a chance. And it's when they got where there's wood, they'd barbecue. But them cow chips, they didn't get, they didn't barbecue there, they just fried it, you know. <laughs> I don't imagine that wouldn't have flavored it too well. It wouldn't have flavored it good. <laughs> no. Did they break them, them broths? Did they uh, break them and uh, use them at the same time? Or oh, yes, they, they use them. them. That is your... breaking Terry, but you so had, to speak, you just used him and broke him together. That's right. You had six of these rascals, and you switched. During the day, you'd ride one of them maybe, uh, according to how hard you're to have to ride, maybe you'd ride him pretty near half the forenoon, maybe three hours, two or three hours. Then you'd catch another and take him and let that and loose for rest because they had no grain. Everything is grass. And he had to have something to eat. And they, they'd switch them horses about every three hours. I'd take quite a herd of horses just to... Six. Six, they did, they'd take them quite a bunch of horses, and they, well, they had a bunch. They always had a bunch of these darn western ponies in there. They was just ponies running around on an average of about, oh, eight to nine hundred pounds. They, That's about, I guess they were tough, though, I guess. They were tough. <laughs> you know, they, tough is the name for them. They was all tough, and they was just as ordinary as it was tough. <laughs> 
It was a, it, it is every morning and every day uh, during the day. That's it. It is every day during the day you'd find them that way. Whenever you caught one up and had to switch your mount, get another mount, well, by God, you had to ride when you got him because every blame one of them seemed like they never quit bucking till they had rode him quite a bit. And he wore himself down and then he'd, he'd mind you. Uh, next time you got on, be things. Same <laughs> darn medicine to be done over. <laughs> Take the same dope again. <laughs> you know, uh, well, it's taking the man that's had plenty of backbone to stay with it. professional road you were now to done that. They no. Ten seconds all the way riding. That, that's all. They wouldn't have done that back and forth all day. No. The lamb boys had to be tough. And they all had to wear boots, or did wear boots. That's their spurs on it, you know. And you never got on a horse without your spurs. That is the part to hold on with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hang them down on their belly. <laughs> and right, they get them down in that saddle girt, you know. If he a pretty tough one, they'd hook that spur down into that saddle girt, and you couldn't get you off of there. You locked the rails? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them got locked around on bad ones that way. They'd lock them, they had, but not so many. There weren't too many of them that locked them because that way you ruin your horse. Mm -hmm. You so punch you, oh yeah. boy, howdy. You punch holes in his hide, don't think yeah. you don't. And then when you get on him, you know you've got trouble because he'll pitch much harder. Yeah. After he gets sore, you know, that way. Anything touch him, well, he just kick you or bite you. Something I wondered about, how did uh, they preserve uh, their food? Uh, now, in trailers, they had plenty of fresh meat with them, but now, like the homesteaders and all, like uh, y'all was, or yeah. masters and all, in yeah. the early days out yeah. there, now, how did they... Uh, Keep their fresh meat? Uh-huh, preserve well, their meat. I'll mm -hmm. tell you how they did it. They sunk a pole, they had always trying to pull if they could get a 25 or 30-foot pole with a block and tackle on it, top of it, and they would take that quarter of beef or whatever they had and pull it up there 25 to 30 feet and the flies don't bother it and the hot yeah. sun don't spoil it. You'd think it would cause it to spoil, but it doesn't. Yeah. It, don't, it just cures and dries up in there. Mm. You, you can just keep cutting off of it till it gets down where it's so darn dry way you're going to get another one. Yeah. Well, that's the way they do it. They, when it gets so darn dry, they can't slice it good. Why they? They turn in and kill another and have a fresh one. Were they but very particular what kind of brand it had on it when they got ready to butcher one? Well, as a rule, they're their own bunch. They hardly ever would kill another fellow's brand. Yeah. As they tried to keep their own brand, and that there was, and they saved the hide if they killed one. They saved the hide so that they, they know who had got it, you know. Now, like the nesters. Preventing somebody from killing them. Yeah, from rustling. Yeah, when my uh, when we was there, uh, Hungate told father. Well, so did the boys over there at uh, on uh, Duck Pond there by Beaver City. Oh, the Hewlett Ranch. You no, know? yes, yeah, the Hewlett Ranch. He said, whenever you want a beef, save the hide for me, and you pick you out one. Get your beef and kill it, but save the hide. They want to know who was doing this. There's lots of them, you know, by and just mm -hmm. trying to kill different ones, you know, and they'd waste, they'd bury it, keep the cowmen from finding out who was doing this. Well, they, they told Potter, when you want a beef, you just save the hide, throw it on the fence out there or on something, and when the boys come by the wagon, they'll pick it up. And we had fresh meat. Well, we had beef or deer meat all the time. There's plenty of deer there then. Yeah, yeah there's lots of them. A few elk, not many, but a few elk. How about antelope? Oh, antelope? God, they're, they're as thick as jackrabbits, these antelopes was. And they, they're not good eating. I don't like antelope. Some may like them, but I don't. Some way now, they're more like a goat. I don't like goat meat. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
When they're there, antelopes just like a goat meat. I don't think I'd like it. <laughs> Yeah, and then prairie chicken during the season that way. We got lots of prairie chicken or grouse as they sage hens, they call them prairie chickens as sage hens or grouse, either one. There were a lot of those. But there wasn't many ducks and stuff like that till way late in the in the fall when they'd be uh, migrating from one place to another, you know. Mm -hmm. But they were about fishing that was it? Oh, golly, them streams was full of fish. And the most of it was channel cat. Yeah, yeah that's what we had out there. Now, where we lived there on, uh, oh, uh, at Beaver City there, Palladora, or uh, not Beaver City, but up there by Palladora, my uh, father would a few hundred fish. Mother wanted fish for uh, for dinner, or sometimes once in a while he'd take enough and he wanted fish for breakfast. He'd turn in and take a cane pole, and he'd get him a grub worm or a grasshopper or something, go down there, and it wouldn't be able to short time, but he'd come back with all the fish he needed for that meal. And they'd have them early, and any time of day you wanted them, that's all you needed. Get a little bait, just in one old fishing pole, just a straight pole, and go down there and go lay there. There's a hitting. Uh, Them streams are full of fish then. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't think it out in dry country. No, you there. wouldn't. Now, the beaver there was an awful good fish stream, and so was the Palladora, come down from the south into the beaver. It is another good little, mm -hmm. it is a smaller stream than the, uh, than the beaver was. What did the uh, Homesteaders and nesters. Yeah. What did they uh, do for uh, a little bit of spending money? They would then some things, put more sugar and oh, salt yes. and things well, like that. Well, now what did they do for money? They get the, cash. Uh, I'll tell you what they done. They gathered up bones around over the prairie, and they get a wagon load of them. They'd take them to Liberal, Kansas, that is north of us, 35. Uh -oh. Yeah, buffalo bones and cow bones, anything, just white bones, you know. And they'd gather them, and if they get a load and take it up there, a good load, a wagon load of bones, you'd get maybe seven dollars for the entire load. Well, that there would buy lots of groceries. That'd be such as brown sugar and coffee and and bacon. Once in a while, they'd buy bacon, you know. But uh, it is mostly coffee and uh, coffee and a sack of flour, you know, or something like that. They had to have. In them days, they didn't have these knickknacks like we have now, sweets and stuff that way. The sweetness that we got was uh, brown sugar, lumps of brown sugar. We didn't get no candy much. If we did, just known as stick candy, whorehound candy mostly, and peppermint them two brands. And I, I was, oh, I must have been eight, nine years old before ever I got a hold of this year store candy. Yeah. And the guys said, well, they buy sugar, well, I just get a lump of brown sugar, that's all I got. <laughs> and I had to stay left the house and I'd catch you at it, of course. But they'd learn you different. <laughs> First time Paul ran out of sugar for his you coffee. Right. Your mother didn't have a little well, bucket. He, he didn't Dang use he, he didn't it. use it for his coffee. It was just for the cooking and yeah. stuff that away. He never got sugar for his coffee. No, it was just old black. Yeah, he got it. That's the way they raised it. Was settlers very many settlers around in that area at that time? He was out there. No, there was. Let's see, there was. Uh, Oh, there's up and down the bottom there. Up down to the mouth of, uh, from the Palladora on down towards uh, Grand Valley, the little post office there, they call Grand Valley. That is right close to Beaver, or not Beaver, but, uh, oh, Palladora. It is right south or northeast of Palladora there. There's a place they call, I told you there, well, there's, oh, 
before I came to think of those known places. I didn't think I'd ever forget them. But anyhow, this little place, Trading Post, was a store, a post office. They had a place to get mail, and there was a darn scatter, and the mail was out there. That was carried in on horseback, you know. And there was a, a outfit there, and I forget the name of that brand, that they, they wanted to buy this fella. This rancher wanted to buy a 50-gallon barrel of liquor for us to keep out on the ranch, you know. And he told this here fella that Grand, Grand Valley is what I was trying to Grand think of, at Grand Valley what he wanted. And he sold him a 50-gallon barrel and told him that he'd have it at a certain time for him. 50-gallon barrel of whiskey. Well, I don't know what this year ingredients was that they made it out of, but the, I know how they made it, that is, how they fixed the barrel. They'd taken the plug at the back of one of them old long plugs, I think there's, there's three or four 10 cent cuts on the plug, and they nail that down right in the bottom of the barrel, that plug at the back, of, that long plug, mm -hmm. and then they fill that up with water and he puts this uh, ingredients of whatever it was that he poured in there. And when he got that filled, why they turned and put the head in after he stirred it up and kept it stirred for a while. And they put the head in and plugged it up. And that darn stuff would make you drunk as crazy drunk. He could drink it from a, he gave my father a gallon for the care of the water for him to make this 50 gallon. And Father, he did, he liked his drink, but he didn't know what to do. And the time he got that darn thing made and all, he got his gallon, he'd taken a big drink of it. We was a mile and a half west of Paladora, or of Grand Valley, up there on the Beaver. And uh, he started home on this his horseback, riding a little bay mare we had there, family mare, you know. Mm. And she was gentle. If she hadn't been, she had got killed. And he he run her all the way home. Well, and a half west of Paladora, or of Grand Valley, and I found the beaver. And, uh, he started home on this, his horseback, riding a little bay mare we had there, family mare, you know. Mm -hmm. And she was gentle. If she hadn't been, she had got killed. And he, he run her all the way home about. And when he got up there, he went to get off, and his foot hung in the stirrup. And around the old side of the house she went with him, he was dragging out there, and we were doing the darn to get in front of him. Mother was to stop him, stop her, and eventually got him stopped and got him out of it. But it didn't happen to break his leg or do any damage, and you sobered him up the whole lot, don't you? Well, many times peeled him up. It did, it, he was, he was all skinned up, but, but she yeah. never kicked him as a rule. They had kicked him, but her being a gentle animal out of the way, she didn't kick him, he named a dragon. And she, he got loose, and mother got her stopped and got him loose. But that's what that crazy whiskey would do. You just made, well, heck, it knocks you right now. But I forget what they got for that barrel of liquor. I, I forget Pa told me what he was to get this rancher paid him for that 50 gallon. Well, you just think a fish a gallon of water with that dang stuff. And that, with that uh, plug of tobacco in there and this other stuff, it made up a good flavor, they said. It tasted all right. But then, boy, oh, oh boy, it had a kick to it. And that old boy, he just made a mint of money. I have, uh, Dances around occasionally. Yeah, they'd, they'd have dances in them old sod houses. They would, when they had a dance, the boys would come in and uh, they'd taken their guns off and when they come inside and they had a stack of them sometimes, I bet you, that was so two and a half, three foot high. 
six shooters and belts back in that corner. That's where they're all put up in the corner. And the way they kept it, you'd think it'd be dusty in there, but it wasn't, and I'll tell you how they kept it down. They'd taken uh, salt and water and wood ashes, or these old ashes they got, you know, from the, those chips. They'd take that and mix it and get it thin that way so it'd scatter good, and they'd spray around over this here uh, room, this here floor, with that, and it didn't take it but just a very few minutes, you know, to get dry on that old dry floor. And they could dance on that of them old boots by jingles, and you wouldn't get no dust raising up like you'd imagine to raise up in the house, but there was. And they, their music was either a French harp, once in a while they'd have a violin, <laughs> but most of the time there's no French harp. No piano? No, oh, no. Well, eventually, later, the years, just as we were leaving there, somebody brought in a guitar. One of the neighbors got it. I don't know where. Well, <laughs> them, uh, you know, cowboys, when they sat around the campfire and the trailers and all that, they entertain themselves playing. Just singing, singing, harmonica and singing now. That's the way they, that was the entertainment, the music they had. And they had a, oh, oh, what did they call them? Juice harp that they used to play, you know. There's quite a number of them. They had a lot of them. And some fellas singing and playing, you know. That was their entertainment. And the music was either Jewish harp, French harp, or an old violin. And there wasn't many of them as a good violinist, I guess. <laughs> but it was a noise, and that was all. It's a work of it. Yeah, it's oh, well. Most anything is entertaining. Well, they had to make their own entertainment, you see. Good, yeah, that's right. It didn't have to be good. But they had, uh, when they went to church, we had a west of our place up there where we was at. There was a West Bertrand, Bertrand, I believe was the name of those folks. There was a man and his wife and two grown girls. And uh, they turned in and they got the bunch together and they built a, a side house up there for Sunday school and the whole church in, you know. And they fixed the old seats around the sides, you know. They didn't have no chairs, wagon seats and stuff that way around the side of the inside for your set on, you know. Mm -hmm. And then boys, as I was telling you, would take their guns off and they put them back in the corner when they'd go in. And their hats went off and they was gentlemen all the way through. They acted that way and tickled to death to get to come to church or Sunday school, whichever it was. And the women, the women back then was a, a whole lot more respected than what well, they are now. Well, oh, I should say they were. You dare to say anything in any insulting word to a woman if you did. There's all of somebody handy well, taking charge. He taking charge. Well, or not. Yes, sir. He don't, didn't care if he'd ever seen her before or not. If anybody said anything out of the way to a woman, there was always somebody taking it up right now. And sometimes it, it wound up in a shooting scrape. They'd grab their guns and go outside by doggies and step off. By doggies about 16 steps. And then goes back to back and then face away, you know, and then walk away from each other. And when you got that number of steps out there, you wheeled around and fired. And sometimes both of them would go down, but that's a rule that's going to just be one, maybe. Um, one keeps one from a step in his and <laughs> off a little faster and shooting for the other in turn. Well, sure, they were just men enough that they didn't do it. Yeah. Sure, they wouldn't do it. I seen that in Beaver City down there, right? Got a time or two there in Beaver City. If they, uh, they I don't know what they'd fell out over. But they went out in the middle of the street, and when they did, why, you, everything went to the side. There's nobody, rigs and everything, horsemen, horses and all went to the side. And they stepped off that away, and when they did that, they wheeled and shot. And I got as a rule, why, one or both of them would go down. There's, them days, a six-shooter was the rule, or was the law. I imagine that 
most everybody knew how to use one. And they them. all know because they all practiced with them all the time. They practiced with them things. That is his, his main stay, you know. That is his life right there, that six year old life. I've, I've heard you used to teach a jack rabbit over at Fort Reno with a 45. I can. And the boys, uh, El Reno boys, up there, the boys around there and over the country, uh, when I was working the prisoners, I, I had, well, from 12 to 18 men on the, in the bunch that I was working that the commission allowed me to take out of jail instead of keeping them in jail there and drive them back and forth of the night. I got them to let me make camp and go out like a bunch of thrashing machine hands and set up tents, had our cots, and a, I had my cook. I had two boys in the bunch that I used for cooks that could do cook. Make, they was cooks, and that's all they had to do, do the cooking. And the rest of them went out and worked with me on the job, whatever I was doing, building a bridge or whatever it was. And I kept, kept them out there while I, I spent a year with them that way. You probably started out practicing that 45 when you just oh, I, I was small when I went to using the 40, 45. I was only about 13, 12, 13 years old. That's uh, when I did that. I got, and I, I was coming in one evening. Oh, I'd done this several times, kill rabbits out there setting, you know, in the spring of the year that way. Right north of El Reno up there about Oh, let's see it. That's right east of Concho. There was a fellow who had a little alfalfa field there. It was about, I guess, maybe ten, five or ten acres of it. And it had the darndest bunch of jackrabbits in there. See, we were eating that alfalfa, you know. As we was coming in from work, and I had the boys to, to stop the darn car and to see how many of them things I had killed before they all run, you know. And I get three to five of them before they all got away. Well, it's setting all you had to do is just as fast as you could shoot. So you could did, you, did you aim or just point? Oh, heck, I just turned in and pointed at him. I know where he's at down there. <laughs> and I was coming in on the west of Fort Reno. The last one I remembered I killed for the boys out of way. And they all, well, it was a write up in that Reno paper, and I don't know now where it went. This rabbit j jumped up as I was coming in. I had about 16 men, I think, on the truck then. And uh, this jack jumped up right by the side of the road, and he started up on the incline there. And I had the boy driving, Charlie Carlisle was driving. I said, stop, I want to see if I can hit that fellow. And he was running from me, just how did he go? I might have done that once in a thousand shots, but I made a perfect shot out of it. I hit him in the back of the head, and he was running, and the boys all day jumped off of the truck to run up there to get him, and uh, you couldn't say whether it's coming back or leaving me, but I always I know that I'll be back. <laughs> and they run up and got that rabbit and brought it back, and I'd hit him right in the back of the head, and I bet he couldn't have done it again in a thousand shots. Uh, but I could hit him running, but I hit him that, making a dead shot like that. That is just. That's one of those yeah. things. But they told that when they got in El Reno, and all the boys were, stayed with it. They said, they told them the same story. They said, well, we know it because we saw the rabbit, and we saw him shoot it, and we know it had done it. And they had it in El Reno American. They had that yeah. piece. <laughs> when, uh, when did you start out riding you? Uh, horses or, well, Breaking? Uh, uh, anything besides gentle horses, bronc, well, bronc, when you started riding bronc, I was, uh, I was, I expect I was nine years old when they was in my uncle's. They had these darn western ponies there, and we was right in the edge of the sand hills. There's a string of sand hills runs right west, north of Beaver City, right on west there. And we was living in the edge of them, and the boys, my uncle's, George and and Charlie and Tom, Paul's three brothers, they would turn in and grab me up and put me on this dang bronc, you know. Of course, they had a rope on us. No saddle. All I had to hang on to was the mane. 
and I'd get thrilled, and then they grabbed me and stick me back. I had no choice. They'd, uh, they'd use me just as a dummy that way. And I got so that I'd get the swing of the horse whenever he went. I guess I got to where I could ride him with the swing of it, and me hanging on to that mane. And then came down here. I didn't have no saddle out there. And after the opening of the country here in 89, why, I got me an old broke down saddle for, I think it was $3. It was my first one. I think it was $3 I got. Some fella discarded it, you know, didn't want it. My father fixed it up for me so I could use it. And I went to breaking horses. And I got them for the use of them. See, we only had to span the ponies. And you plow them all day on an old plow, or uh, working them, that they're pretty well worn out, you know. Well, if I wanted to go anywhere, I got as I couldn't take them because they were too tired. And I had, had to let them rest because as all the feed they got was grass. We didn't have no grain, not the first year. And so by I guess I'd have, I broke horses for the use of them. And when I got him broke and the fellow was satisfied, why, well, I'd get some other fellow. I always had one. Here, I got one to break. You take him and use him. <laughs> and I did that for, I think it was about two years I worked at that. That's how I remember. That's how, and uh, it, I was doing that. And so uh, I uh, I turned in once in a while. I would strike a fellow. I fell it here on the river, north of town here. I was trying to think of his name now. I can't call it to mind. But anyhow, he had a mare down there, four year four year old. She'd weigh about nine hundred pounds and he wanted her broke. He said he gave me five dollars to break her. Well that was a lot of money. Five dollars, boy, howdy, I'd been <laughs> I had money when I was breaking one for five dollars. Well I'd taken this little animal and he wouldn't allow me wasn't don't allow me to break her with spurs. I told him, well, I says, you just keep your mare. I can't, I can't break her. No. And he found out I wouldn't, so he said, well, if you're determined to, to wear her spurs, I don't want her cut up. Well, I says, I mean, I, I won't cut her up much. I says, but I'll make her mind me. So I broke this little mare, and boy, she was a rough one. And I turned in. Uh, I have a mighty head, because I, when I got her broke, she was gentle. You could run up to her and she'd stand there. Of course, she'd throw her head up and kind of shy if she was, if she was running. And you'd get up there and walk up to her and she wasn't shy. But if you run up to her, she would. And I got her broke so that he could get on and ride her and do anything he wanted to. And he said, well, I'm satisfied. He gave me $5. I remember that $5 bill as well as... <laughs> well, how old were you there? Oh, uh, let's see. I was about 11, 12. Let's see. 10, 11, I was right 12 years old then, when I was doing that. And Father, he, he's afraid I'd get hurt, and he tried, tried to keep me from doing this. But I had to have something to ride. And as long as I didn't get hurt, why, he didn't mind it. I've been thrilled, don't think I have him. I've had my head stuck on <laughs> the ground. How many, so, how many broken bones have you had now? Well, I couldn't tell you. I've been rolled over, horse fall left me and roll over me. But he's never, never mashed me. They're pretty heavy as they go over, but they're just, just right now, and it's on over, you know. It don't, he don't lay on there. He just hits you, and he'll fall and roll over you. But you're lucky if you don't get your leg caught in the stirrup or something. And I, I've had him do that with me numbers of times. And I've got broken bones, too. I've got broken legs. Well, well. What happened to that cashew leg there? He <laughs> banged it up all the time. That there was, uh, I was taking a bunch of cattle to the pasture on Sunday after a sleet storm, and the ground had this coat of ice on it. And these, these Chickasaw cattle that uh, Tom Cox up here, the butcher, had bought. And I was uh, taking them to the pasture out here down for Jim Smith, northwest of town. And uh, this one, left a bunch, you know. I had about 12 or 15. I forget how many I did have in the bunch, but just a few that way. And she quit them, and she was 
well, to run and this little mare that I noticed I'd rode so much, you know, she just wheeled and went in after and when she turned her, didn't have no shoes on, no barefooted, and her feet went from under. And she fell and slid on my leg there for about 14 foot. They measured at the ground there where it marked it, about 14 foot. Well, that broke my leg across the instep, and this ankle was busted up there and above it. It was just all mangled up in there. Till they didn't, Doc wanted to cut it off, and I wouldn't let him. And he was going to any, and I said he'd have to later, and I said no. So he put it in a plaster Paris cast crude outfit that he made in them days. I didn't know too much about things. But he put it in there, and I made me a wooden leg out of an old cedar post from Mr. Ellison, our neighbor down here in the east part of town. He built Ellison's place. Uh, he had a cedar post around his fence, and I, I had my brother go down and cut one of them out. I couldn't get no stick no more. <laughs> he cut that out. And it was for, oh, I guess a month or more before Miss Allison missed it. And so I made me a wooden leg there. And I worked, I lost one week's work in the meat market. I was working for Tom Cox then. And you still, you still got that leg. How many, how many oh, God, years have you been carrying that? I, think, I was 16 years old when that happened. 16 years old when that happened, and I've carried it ever since up to the present. Yeah, I know it bothers me. I'm uh, yeah. just now getting it healed up over the third time of this broken went to running. It's hard to get it to heal when it goes to running. And uh, my uh, nephew over here at the city, a doctor over there, he sends me some stuff up here to put on it, doctor it, and take care of it for me. But I get, I get around on it. I hope I get around. And this other I thing. I get around that well yeah. I'm your age. That is my left leg. Now my right one's all, well, you'd think it was uh, broke, but it ain't been broke. It's just for a bronze shooter. And uh, I see that you can see how that's like that. See there? Uh-huh. Well, that's just where they reach back to ride them. That's, you're spurring him out of the way. He'll reach back if he don't watch him. He'll grab you. Your darn leg. With his teeth. And that's how it's going to have to be all black that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was done, I think, they snap off of that leg. I got his wrist like something was broken. I'll get that. Their teeth snapped and they had to get the move from that. But that's what buggered that leg up. But my left one here is the one that's broke, it's broke across the instep there, and right here at the top of the ankle, and that's here, right in here, that's where that's been running, just in there, it's dark, you can see there, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's healing up, it was running, it's, I've got it healing again, see that at all, yeah, that there is, it's getting uh, straightened out all right. And that's what bothers you. Yeah. Well, we know. And another one probably didn't too. I uh, don't think there's hurt anything out of the broken bones. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've had my ribs knocked loose, a few of them, but they seem to heal up all right. Um, well, when did you uh, come to this area from the same land? From we come here in 89. 89. Fourth Fourth day of July. We like to run or? No, the folks come in. We, yeah. We, we come in with the cattle and stock afterwards. We come down with the wagons, you know, down by Fort Reno and on down on the north side of the river, across the river, up there north of El Reno at, at Union, or Reno City. No, I came to Frisco first. Yeah. That is quite a little town. We come down the half section line from the Keith Ranch up there, Keith Indian Ranch Reservation or ranch that they had up there, right north of El Reno, northeast of El Reno. And we came down on the north side of the river to Frisco in 89, the fourth day of July. 
And then we said we stayed there that day, and the next day, I believe it was, we went out there a mile east. Let's see, a mile east, yeah, let's see, cut right. That's two miles, no, two miles east. And north, up on, uh, up this side of Piedmont, up there, six miles north of town here, on the, to the line, the school land. We got this school land settled on it, and had to pay in a, a tax, you know, there. Of, I think that was $35 a year for the use of it. At 160, after we paid for that, and then we stayed there till Father got taken sick, and we had to come to sell out. And well, we'd went broke, or having doctors to come out to take care of him. We had to come to town and get in here, and the Masonic, the Masons, and the Odd Fellows. Father belonged to both. They made up a jackpot for him and got him on his feet, and with their assistance and all. We all went back okay again. <laughs> and I went to work at 50 cents a day for hauling water for Sam Poole that run the uh, livery barn down here at the east end of town. He had a livery barn there, and them days we didn't have a lot of wells around. There's only two or three wells. There's one public well here right across from where the First National Bank is now in the center of the street, but it didn't give enough of water. And there was another one down there with the livery barn, but uh, it was another shallow one. Then there was one a block north and two, let's see, one, two, two blocks west on the north side of Cedar Street here now. There was another livery barn over there then. And at the back of that barn, they had a pretty good well there, but nobody wanted to use the water because it was right there with the barn, you know. Yeah. And we hauled water at 50 cents a barrel and filled the barrels up around over town that way. They'd have you, well, bring me a barrel of water. Yeah. 50 cents a barrel, 50 cents a barrel. Yeah, 50 cents a barrel, and I was working for 50 cents a day. Oh. Mm -hmm. And right. so as I get in the water out here where they uh, City Park is now, right here on Turtle Creek. There was a well out there. Was it that farm where they uh, used to camp on the Tatum side? No, that is on south of it, a half mile. Yeah, but this one out here was a well that had been dug and they had a windmill on it. Somebody had money enough, Spencer's I believe it was, put this windmill up there. Later, they didn't at first, we had to, had to pump it, you know, at first. In the later days, they put a windmill there. But you couldn't pump that dry. Yeah. And I've had a threshing machine to pump. I eventually got smart and got this here pump fastened onto the wagon so that I could drop the hose into this well and I could pump these barrels full. It wasn't so long, long of doing it. <laughs> You tell me, you tell me, yeah, and then the residents all over town buy dollars for 50 cents a barrel. And every time one would run short, why, the guy says, Oh, let's bring me a barrel of water. And this, and it kept me busy hauling. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it did. It just kept me busy. And I got 50 cents a day for it. Well, that beat nothing. I wasn't doing nothing, I wanted to get nothing, and Father couldn't get no work. There was no work for him. So by God, I stayed with that there till on, till uh, I was trying to think, Sam Carson, I believe it was, a blacksmith here. He got a, a well down there, and lots of them would go to his place, you know, and carry it away. He didn't mind them having it. They didn't charge him nothing for the water. And they'd carry it off in buckets, you know, and little kegs and barrels. And then drink a little as another or two from, got a well dug, you know. It eventually put me out of business. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did you uh, get to be a ship uh, Well, that there came in, and I was 17 years old when uh, John Hackett 
He was under Sheriff at El Reno under Tom Jackson, I believe it was Tom Jackson. Either Jackson or Cannon, and I don't remember now for sure which it was. But he was an uh, under-sheriff, and he came down after a fellow here that had shot his father-in-law and mother-in-law's house full of holes with an old 45, and they had him arrested, got a warrant for him. And that is down in the river bottom where the lake is now, Lake Overholster here. Yeah. And so uh, they come down to get him, this uh, under-sheriff did, you know. And by golly, when he got down here, he hunted all day, uh, all forenoon. He couldn't catch him because this fellow seen him first, I guess. And there's lots of weeds and growth and brush down there, and he, he outsmarted him. He couldn't get him. And he was back up here, high as horse and buggy days. He came back up town, and I was talking with him. By golly, I said, well, if I couldn't get a darn kid like that, I'd take my badge off. And I shouldn't have said it. He told me, says, well, you're so smart, I deputize you to go do that. Uh-oh, that's what I done. And that you said the wrong huh? thing. Yeah, I said, I talked out of turn. I told him I was no officer, but and the old head there says, well, Roy, says, we're witnesses to it. I got to go there. <laughs> you had, yeah. had, to had to go do it. Well, I went down there. And and I wasn't gone but about an hour. I crossed the river twice with him down there. I, I seen I had him, I got his trail where he'd been running in the sand there, not along next to the bank. None. I, did, I didn't know for sure, but I had this taken an idea that it was him that had seen me and a runner. And I didn't know, but I followed that a ways. And I seen on the opposite side of the bank where he waded into the river, it the uh, water was running back down the, from where he had waded out. There's it, it, water on his trousers, you know, he never pulled them off. And so by golly, if he'd crossed, so I waited over there, and he'd went into an old abandoned farmhouse out there where the darn weeds and stuff, sand burrs was knee high. I was careful in getting out there because I didn't know where he had a gun or where he'd shoot me or what, so. I got out there, and when I found out where they went in the window, and, and I was careful, and I slipped around easy to see if I could see him in there. And when I was around on the south side, he crawled back out on the north side, and he seen me first, and he made it back to the river. So I followed him, found where they jumped out there, and his tracks in these sandbars, you see the sandbars are they bent over the way you're running, you know. Mm -hmm. I followed it to the river and crossed again. There's his water running out, out of his tracks where he'd come out on the bank. I met an old man down there, Pete Royston. Royston, I believe, is the old man's name. He was bringing his mule down to the river to water it. And he happened to see me, and he was hard to hear. And I was talking with him. He wondered what I was doing down there. I told him I was looking for sure things in me, but I couldn't catch him. His water on his trousers, you know, he never pulled them off. And so by golly, if he'd crossed, so I waited over there, and he'd went into an old abandoned farmhouse out there where the darn weeds and stuff, sand burrs was knee high. I was careful in getting out there because I didn't know where he had a gun or where he'd shoot me or what, so. I got out there, and when I found out where he just went in the window, and, and I was careful, and I slipped around easier to see if I could see him in there. And when I was around on the south side, he crawled back out on the north side, and he seen me first, and he made it back to the river. So I followed him, found where he jumped out there, and his tracks in these sandbars, you see the sandbars are they bent over the way you're running, you know. Mm -hmm. I followed it to the river and crossed again. There's his water running out, out of his tracks where he'd come out on the bank. I met an old man down there, Pete Royston. Royston, I believe, is the old man's name. He's bringing his mule down to the river to water it. And he happened to see him, and he was hard to hear. And 
the nurse talking with him. He wanted to know what I was doing down there. I told him I was looking for sure thing Jimmy, but I couldn't catch him down there in them weeds. And, and I was supposed to get him, bring him back. I said, I can't get him down here, so I thought I'd go back home. I was looking for sure thing Jimmy, but I couldn't catch him down there in them weeds. And, and I was supposed to get him, bring him back. I said, I can't get him down here, so I thought I'd go back home. And he kept talking so loud, and me having to talk to him. And sure thing was in the darn brush there right across to us, and I didn't know it. And so I started to leave. And in them weeds, you didn't have to go, you know, a hundred feet till you was out of sight, pretty near. And doggone it, I, I hear the old man, well, hello, sure thing, talking to him. He talks loud, you know. Yeah. And I heard him call him by name, you know. So I slipped back down through these weeds down there while he was talking to the old man and had him interested. I was making it through the weeds. And I walked out onto him and told him he was a fellow for wanting. <laughs> And I brought him in. So you've been at FC, or I've been, been law, law, law ever since. Heard to make him ever since. Yeah, 17 years old. Still got one. Mm -hmm. They won't let me do without it. And that's uh, an old enough bag your boy had to do Yeah, there. that's an old one. Yeah. <laughs> you let's mark it. He spelled sure wrong on it. Yeah, that spelled sure wrong on it. That's right. And that's said, uh, I believe you both said your daddy carried Yeah, father was. Hadn't. He was, he was uh, deputized as U.S. Marshal the second year after we got here. The Marshal there was Kuntz. I think his name was John, I believe it was, I remember, John Kuntz. He was the United States Marshal. That was uh, under him, Isaac. Parker, a hanging judge out of Fort Smith. Yeah, that's part of the Yeah, over them yeah. Well, that was now Oklahoma. Yeah, that is headquarters, Indian Territory. See, the Indian Territory, and we had to take him to Fort Smith. But he worked under Kuntz then, Deputy U.S. Marshal. Our father was the Deputy U.S. Marshal. And I, on this other deal, when I brought this fellow in, about a week, it's just a matter after that. Father had been out here with Piedmont. He did post office it was then. There was no Piedmont. It was a post office a mile east of where Piedmont is now. And I was, uh, I went out there where he did that day serving some papers. And on his way back, he stopped at the post office for to get something. And there's a fellow by the name of Cooper running as a one-armed fellow. And he wanted to know what parts are doing out there. So what are you looking for today, Johnson? No, there's an officer. And he tipped it off to these two fellows that was there. There's two outlaws there, Hoskam and Nation. One of them had five charges of murder and seven and six. So they was no pets, you know. Well, he came on home, and when he got home, why, he was telling me about it. I says, why didn't you get him? Well, he says, I wasn't quite ready. He says, what do you think about it? you think you're brave enough to go with me over there and get him? Well, I said, where's me going? Well, we got my uncle's old Sherry, one of these old two-seated outfits that had curtains on it, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Wade goes over there, and these boys decided they'd better get out and get them a job of wheat shocking, you know, and they wouldn't be noticed then, which they did. They'd been out that day, and they was a walking in from the north, a mile north of the post office. They'd come in from over there, and there's about a half a mile north of the post office. We seen these two fellows were walking, and Paul thought that or saying he wasn't sure. And he says, I believe it's them are coming down yonder now. And I was sitting in the back with this Winchester because they'd, they'd relied on me because I was a good shot at a running target or a moving target. I was a, had a good shot at it. They gave me to Winchester and father and his brother, Tom, was in the front seat. And uh, father had his, didn't have no scabbard. He just stuck this gun down in his trousers, 45. And when he went to get it out of his trousers to cover this fellow, he got it hung up in there. And Tom covered his man on the other side of the buggy. They divided, you know, coming down the road, one on each side. And so by God, if I covered this other one for Winchester, and father got his gun then, and this fellow kept begging him to hurry up and get out there and search. And says, we ain't got no guns on us. And says, search us till that kid and take that Winchester down. He says, he'd kill somebody. He ain't talking about me, you know. Mm. Well, by dog, he, he went searching and they didn't happen to have, so we handcuffed him and put him in the back and brought him to town and taken him to Del Reno. Put him in jail up there, and that night they dug out of this brick jail. That's all they had them days, a brick jail up there. And one of them got out, and he got away. They got him the next day over here in the city, killed him over there. And this one got hung up in there, trying to get through. It didn't have the whole dug big enough for him. He had it large in the hip. And uh, they caught him the next morning, you know, or that fourth morning, a guard walking to, found him out there. And they pulled him through and skinned him like you would a rabbit. <laughs> oh, they pulled the hide off his hip, you know, pulled him out through there. And that other one, he jumped in the buggy down there the next morning with an old man and an old lady. And of course, they had wired telegraph. Oklahoma said they'd look out for him, you know. They telegraphed him, no phone. And they got us this officer, spotted him. They were getting in there, the way they was acting and all, and he has warned about him, and he tried to stop him, and he started to run this horse, and he shot him out of there and got him, stopped him. And what what did they uh, do with the one that... Uh, he, went to, he went to South Carolina. Where? <laughs> yeah. where? McAllister. Oh. <laughs> That's where they're taking him. They got him down there. But yeah, he had to go to... They're taking him down. I don't know where he served time or what they done with him. I never did learn. Yeah. I got to remember. They sent him over the road, though, to see him. Because he had that many jobs of murder against him, you see. Mm -hmm. They expect he got the, the chair, or not the chair, but the rope. Them days they didn't have, they didn't yeah, have they, they didn't tolerate no punishment. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's why they call him the hanging judge down there, or Judge Credinger. Mm -hmm. Did they ever have any hangings or lynchings around in, around in this country? Not in Yukon, around Yukon, no. No, no man. Uh, no man's land. Or oh, out there, if they get one, or they, if they caught a fellow, or if you murdered somebody, killed somebody, and they caught you, there was no, c you didn't go to court. They got a limb someplace, or a wagon tongue. That's where you spent your days. <laughs> There's one out there by Beaver City that he'd killed an old man and stole his horses. And they recognized the horses, you know, and this fellow with them, why they know they had the right man. And in doing so, he turned in the Billy Hancock and his deputy was a following him. And uh, they found him. They'd been out 
I think it was a day or two days that they had been following him. But anyhow, they was out of water, you know. They had to have water, and they didn't have no canteen with them, so they seen this year timber down there on the other south, and let's see, that way southwest of uh, Beaver City. Any south, or north, south, and east, pretty much. So they seen that, and they went to it. You know, there's water where there's green stuff out of there. There's bound to be water too close from us. And when he got over there, where there was a, a dugout and a, a man standing out in front, and they went down there. And this fella that they was a chasing had killed this fella's buddy and taken their team and left the team that they was hunting there. And so this Mexican went to get off of his horse to go down to help, you know. And the six shooter slid out of the holster and discharged and killed him. Mm. That was uh, Della Hancock's deputy. The lad was two dead ones right there. So uh, Della and the, this other fellow loaded them onto to the old wagon that they had there. And he taken them on in, and Della turned in, taking up this trail. And he caught the, this fellow. And he was hung to a wagon tongue. He didn't have no tree handle. Mm-hmm. And they, they put, uh, no, sir. They was, you wouldn't think they could hang you on a wagon tongue, but you can. Choke you to death if you don't hang you. <laughs> I've wondered how they managed to uh, keep track uh, tracking somebody, an outlaw like that, from across the country. I was well, reading a uh, story I about that. Uh, uh, law up in, uh, they started out up around Denver somewhere. Denver. A fella who wanted Denver. to do a robbery. Yeah, Denver. They followed Denver. him down south through Colorado Spring, down into the Texas Panhandle, yeah. and they told where he crossed uh, over into Oklahoma there on yeah. the Warsaw River, mm-hmm. followed the Warsaw River down, and yeah. they captured him down yeah. there because of that. Yeah. Well, now, how did he manage to stay well, on his trail? I'll tell you why. Now? If you follow, start out on a man's trail, you can follow him if it's out to the open that way for a thing ain't hitting plowed ground or anything. That horse track will bend the grass or the weeds the way he's a traveling. And you can follow that and you can sight sight it along down ahead of you quite a ways, you know, that grass yeah, will bend for you. Well you can follow that and then you're going to run across somebody, some rider or somebody okay. that he's seen. He yeah. come by some place sure. And when he did, why he you happened to run on to it at just the right one. Well, he'd headed off this way. Well, you know which way to follow. Instead of being the west, or going that way, maybe cross here to the south or southeast. And that's the way they got it. And they just, just seen enough of people along the road accidentally that could give you information. Keep you, uh, get enough from that you could uh, kind of put, put yeah. well figure out give where you, you, you know. give you an idea which way he was uh-huh. traveling all that way you had an idea where he was heading down the river and you just followed well, that grass you're talking about the yeah. grass, yeah. well that grass then they probably uh, well it was a blue stem a high, well it was a blue stem weeds and stuff and just a few stock had been over the country but whichever way you're traveling through that grass, it bends the grass, uh, the weeds, the direction you're going. And you can sight that ahead. That's an Indian way of, of uh, trailing. That's Indian style. And Father was a good one at it. Then he, yeah, he's I trailed them any one of them out up here. And I imagine mother probably learned some <laughs> things from her, didn't he? He might have learned something for her, too. Yeah, I got him. But that is the way she generally wound up. I know he's the old boy that wind up at the end of a rope or... <laughs> Them cattle ranchers didn't tolerate that rustling much either, did they? Oh, no. If they caught you rustling, that is it. They, if they got to you first, well, that settled it. You wasn't given no trial or nothing. If they caught you stealing cattle, chances is you stayed out there on the <laughs> road somewhere <laughs> they fell off. <laughs> That is exactly the way they do it. 
Yeah, it, it put an end to that right now. They stopped that cattle rustling. But that's the way they got along in them days. And they'd, uh, in early days, they'd steal the outlaws. You see, uh, the no man's land, there's that Beaver, or uh, Oklahoma Panhandle, known as no man's land. The outlaws would uh, steal and go into that country early days. And they steal out of Kansas and stuff that way, good horses and stuff that way, and carry it down through there. And they made up a western store. Yeah, they made up a posse to follow out a bunch down to Sodtown. That's in Sodtown is well, let's see which way that is from Beaver City. It's south. It's well, it's yeah, it's south there. And anyhow, they they followed them down to Sodtown. There's a little old store down there, and they called it Sodtown, you know. I give it the name of that. And they run on to a bunch of them, and they had a, a running battle with those outlaws. Therefore, I forget how many miles you could trail them to the horses and dead men across, mm. but they never went back no more. That's the last trip they made a citizens made down in there because they was outlaws was too strong for them. But they was on the run, but yet they got us. And they was well enough they organized. Was enough of them well enough organized. They, they put the citizens on the run that way, you know. And they finished up that way, and they, they could have trailed them there for, I forget how many miles across that prairie, the horses and men that they was and killed. They, you know, Remember how many were killed? No, I never did. Billy Hancock gave us a lowdown on that. Yes. Oh, Billy, he's telling us about how many was in there, but I don't remember. What are some of the uh, more noted uh, outlaws and uh, lawmen that you've uh, come in contact with uh, in your life? Oh, golly. Exposure. And they had him on the run in bad weather, you know, and from the exposure, 
he turned in and, and passed out, and uh, they were so close on him, the U.S. Marshals was, that uh, they they know they was going to made it, make it in home sometime to see his wife. And they found out he was sick. Sure, then they know they would make it or try to make it home. It, and he had made it home all right, but he had died after he got there. And they found, found the place and they surrounded it. And, and when she, Bill's wife came out, why, they asked her if Bill was there and she said, yes, he's here. And she said, she won't harm you, though. And so they forced her ahead of him into the house and when they got in there, there he was laying dead on the bed. He was dead, sure enough. And they give her, you see, there was 500, uh, was it 500? No, it was 1,000, 500 or 1,000, I forget which it was now, 1,000, I think it was, reward on him. And they told her they'd give her half that reward if they'd let him, let him, set him up outside and, and shoot him and take a picture of him so as to have that for identifying him, not that that it killed him. Well, she agreed to it. She knew he was dead and it wouldn't hurt him then. But they never thought in shooting that man uh, in the breast chest here with this buckshot that they shot him with, the holes stayed open. They never closed. The dead flesh, the holes would stand open. If it's live flesh, they're closed. And they never thought of it them days about that. And I'll be darned, they paid off. The government did. Yeah. Paid off by a dollars. But you can you can see yourself, live flesh mm -hmm. that way will close. Well, your dead flesh will stand open. And so, uh, Oh, I was trying to take his name now. He died out here in California. I was trying to think of it. Not Jesse James, but... Uh, oh. His brother was killed at Woodward. Woodward. Oh, Jennings? Huh? Jennings? Uh, Jennings, Al Jennings. Mm -hmm. Old uh, Al, by a dog, he's, he's... He's another good old pal of mine. Al wasn't... He wasn't as bad as a lot of people thought he was. They called him an outlaw and all that, but his brother was killed at Woodward and shot in the back, and he went out for revenge. And you see, his dad was the judge there at Woodward. Judge Jennings? Yes, I read about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, he, he was judge, and he tried to talk Al out of it, but Al went out, him and four other fellows, there's five of them in the bunch. And Al only killed one man, and they claimed that he killed 20. He killed one man down here by the Spike Ass Ranch. He was a little old store. They was riding, and they had run out of food, and they had to have some groceries, and they stopped in at this store. And this fellow came up from back at the counter with a sawed-off shotgun. And the L was a poor shot, but he got him the first dang shot, beat the fellow to it, and got him the first shot. And then he got what groceries they wanted, and they started to leave. And the officers were so close to on him, it was right on him then, that they shot his horse from under him, and and then they all turned in, and the others got away, you know, and now he just headed back towards this bunch shooting, and they broke to run. And he got one of the best horses that he could get a hold of that he'd seen in sight, rode off and got away. Now that happened there, and Al, that's the only man that Al had killed. I know Al personally. He, that fellow there, and they've got it listed that he killed 20 some odd men. Just a movie outfit, you know, that's all of it. False alarm. Oh, I went out to get uh, Doolin's gun out there in California. And the night as I got there, I stayed at my daughter's out there at Corrigan, at uh, Canoga Park. And uh, the next morning, on I had was going to have her to go down to Alice at the Tarzana there, just about a few miles from where she's at. And <laughs> see, Al, I wanted to get this forty-five that Doolin had there, that Al had, you know, and a picture. 
that he had taken on this post uh, this picture about the size of a postcard. Al told me that I could have the gun and the picture when he was through with them. And so I went from here out there thinking that well, he's made all these movies and all that, he's through with them and I was going to get it. And when we got in the car to back out of the garage there at my daughter's, she heard the phone ringing and she got out and went back in to answer to see what it was. And the daughter called her and says, did you hear about Alla dying last night? And that's how close I got. Mm. So I never went on over. I, I wouldn't ask those folks for that because they thought maybe I was just to tell them a story or something. And it didn't look right, so I wouldn't even ask them for the gun. I never got it. But I'd like to have it, I'll tell you. It was a forty-five Colt nickel plated. And he had the notches wore off over there so that he could fan it instead of use it by single action. Mm -hmm. You turn him when you want to shoot anything. Boy, how did you shoot fast too, though, did you? <laughs> that wouldn't be very accurate, though, for I don't know. They didn't. Very far, it it? No, not too far, it wouldn't. But by I got a close it range. Like for rent, a saloon or something. Oh, probably. Oh, inside that thing. Yeah, it'd have been bad. <laughs> you know, it's a, yeah, it sure would. No, that there uh, let old Al out. Let me out, for I wanted that gun so darn bad I went to California to get it. Didn't get it. It would. It'd have been antique, sure enough. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. cousin, actually the cousin of marriage, actually, but her dad was an old time cowboy, and she got his gun. I told her what the hell that was. Well, anyway. She wanted, she wanted to part with it, so I yeah. don't blame her. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, something like that, I wouldn't part with it at all, because I'd just want to keep it, wouldn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Well, that's the way. I, that's the way I'm about Father's badge and stuff. I've got that badge there that I wear, that U.S. Marshal badge and uh, deputy sheriff badge. That's my father's old badge. Mm -hmm. and I was, you couldn't, you couldn't buy that. <laughs> no, see. That was done to you too. It is. Well, that's how it comes to put that. that clip on there. You see that uh, hole in there where you can... Yeah, it that wore from that. It is worn through about, and I was afraid it would break through and fall off and lose it. So I went and had that clear clasp put on there so he could pin it on. Yeah, it's got the deputy on one side and U.S. Marshal on, <laughs> on the other. On the other, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. just about it. How much schooling did you get in your life? I never got on at the fifth grade at fifth reader. They called it fifth grade them days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Reader. Well, fifth that was reader. Good education though for them well, days, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But I got as I never got to go to school. I wasn't where I could, you see. I never got into school and only in the first reader in Madison, Kansas. And uh, I got away from that. We got in here in Oklahoma before I got any more schooling. And I thought I got it here in Oklahoma, you might say. My dad uh, taught his mother how to read and write when he was 18 years old. Is that right? <laughs> they was, she was in the hills of Kentucky. I see. They, they spent their heads back there. No, I, uh, well, I tell you, you get self-experienced self that way, I believe you. You get it better than if you get it read out of a book. <laughs> Summer Daddy Kim folks. I, that was the, they call we called him Uncle Jim. He finally settled out there at Cordell, South Cordell. South of Cordell. And uh, when my dad bank eventually ended up out there, uh, they said back there in Kentucky, he uh, went down to, uh, everybody went to Alexa. Sure. Then took a six six shooter in the <laughs> belt and right. trying to take along a jug of moonshine. Right. Too. Steve, yes. Get yeah. down there. They got down there and uh, they got two rowing each other's tentacles. And yeah. pretty soon they hooked up them six shooters and so 
started shooting. Yeah, that's true. And the shoulder, they were four or five <laughs> down out in the street. And yeah, yeah. Jim, uh, he'd got shot through the <laughs> chest. It didn't go plumb through. He raised a knot up on his back and oh. he went back up the mountain and he laid down the floor there and told his boy to get out the razor. You know, and he cut, cut that sword out. out. His boy started to fly small and slow and he was a demon. Cut him down. Cut that out. <laughs> he cut it on out there, though. Pops on out. Well, I'll tell you, when you find something like that, if you've got a silk handkerchief, tear off a strip of it so that you can and, and take a small stick or something if you can uh, and use it to prod and push that through. When you get that silk handkerchief, that'll pull if there's any lead or anything in there. That pull, it sticks to that silk, and I don't know yeah, why, but it does. It swabs it yeah, out. it swabs it out. Well, you yeah. said lead poisoning. Is that, yeah. does it yeah. actually set up a poison? You're darn right, right as well. If you see it and leave that in there, it'll set up a poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, it will. I didn't know that it was yeah. set up a poison. I've really seen good. an old boy's leg got up here. He shot himself accidentally here with a 45. He had it in his holster here, and he squatted down at the campfire. And some way or another, pull it off and right down through the calf of the leg and hit his heel. And through that calf of the leg there, uh, gal, if I take him out, I'm Doc Shirley, the doctor here. Oh, Doc, you know, he kind of likes to have me around because I could stand the sight of blood and hold for him right away. And uh, we turn in taking a piece of the silk handkerchief and a stick that'll a stick that he had, and he forced this in there down through there and pull that through. And then I know what he poured in there, epoxy, to boil it out. He had that mm. in his kit, and he boiled that out and uh, bandaged it up, and that old boy got okay all but that heel, or it hit the heel that way. It made him limp, yeah, yeah, shattered the bone there, and we never, it made him limp all the time. It, that healed up all right, but. It always made him limp. It made that ankle, you know, bad in there. Have any kind of anesthetics? Them days, the chloroform is the only thing you use them days. Yeah. If it got to hurt too bad, you pour a little chloroform on that. Yeah. Every way you have it. I guess he told you told either the young dentist or <laughs> whoever handed you the young dentist. Yeah, uh, you right. Whoever's handed that's the one that went. <laughs> Yeah, old well, Doc Shirley. Some of them had lots of them. Well, lots of them couldn't stand it. I guess he couldn't stand the sight of blood and the fellow hollering that away. In them days, that chloroform was all they had to use. They didn't have any other anesthetic. Mm -hmm. He that are dead in the pain. You know, just grit your teeth and take it. That's I heard it. That's it. Uh, I heard you tell you. Uh, tell you something about not liking cats one time. Cats? Oh, I hate a darn cat. And I'll tell you why. If there's uh, anyone dead around the place, in early days, you know, you know we didn't have screens on our houses, and if there was anyone died, there's a notice from that uh, person that the dang cats, I don't know where they come from and how they get it, but they'll crawl in through those windows if they're open or a door. And they get, if you don't watch them, they get in on that corpse to eat on it. Well, I've set up with several of them here, and, and the darn cats will come by, golly. You'd be surprised now. Well, they will, just like flies, seems like. Now, and I don't want no cat around. I just hate the darn thing. Thing I was wanting to ask you about, and I know you're getting tired of that too, but uh, Bates, Bates Christian, I've heard, heard, uh, heard of him riding a bronc and rolling a cigarette. Do you ever see him? He can do that. He can ride a bronc, and I'll tell you another thing. Oh, Bates, uh, had, he done that at a show a time or two. He put a silver dollar in the bottom of his stirrup and put his foot in on top of that. With that silver dollar under his doggone boot, he'd ride a bucking horse with it. And when he got through where that silver dollar was there, he'd done that at Fort Reno. Yeah. Old Bates done that. I know he done ride that. Ride until he 
We quit loading up there. Oh, wait, one last thing I went to ask you about, man. I know you're getting tired of that shit, but uh, Bates, Bates Christian, I was hoping to I was hoping to I've heard of him <laughs> riding a bronc and loading his head with that. Do you ever hear of He can do that. He can ride a bronc. And I'll tell you another thing. Well, Bates, uh, had he done that at a show a time or two. He put a silver dollar in the bottom of his skirt and put his foot in on top of that. With that silver dollar under his doggone boot, he'd ride a bucking horse with it. And when he got through where that silver dollar was there, he'd done that at Fort Reno. Well, Bates done that. I know he done Not that. until he quit. He quit, rode him up there, and when he got off, there was that silver dollar there. That showed that he had mm. <laughs> pressure on that stamp, didn't it? Well, he used to ride the saddle, too, I heard. No, old Bates was good. He was a good He Fort Reno was a remount station where they broke horses to send across the water, you know, in mm. different places out of there. Well, he rode with Buffalo Bill while we still there at one time. Yeah, I, I, I believe he, he did. Advertise, he used to advertise him as, as Buffalo Bill did, you know, on his uh, show posters. Yeah. Had any outlaws that was on his road, just bring them <laughs> Bring them in. Them in. <laughs> <laughs> well, them outlaws with them horses, they couldn't ride, you know. Uh -huh. I imagine they were the show bench and rank them. Oh, boy, time. they were. And Fort Reno, I'll tell you right now, to see them riding up there. They had bad ones, and lots of them. Them Montana horses was their worst. Mm -hmm. There was a big stout horse, you know. And by golly, they just seemed like they wouldn't quit. Yeah, I heard him mention, say something one time about how they had some, he got off up in that country one time, where they had some <laughs> 17, 1800 pound horses up there. Why, they were great big devils. Well, then they couldn't stand long, you know. They'd pitch, for, they'd pitch off a hard for a short time. But if you get one that'll stay with you, you get something down around 1,000 pound, 900 to 1,000 pound. And it just seems like he don't know when to quit. <laughs> well, about that. Well, but maybe that's a, I don't know, you probably know him. He used to come to that meeting and have fun. Uh, Daisy Davis. From Daisy. Bring those there. He, uh, Daisy Davis. Thank worked you. for railroad for 40 some years, I think. Mm. I, I heard think. him telling at one of them historical meetings that uh -huh. he'd come down from Mon Montana as a yeah. bronc tailor. And yeah. Fort Reno, sure. worked there five years before he joined the <laughs> railroad. Yeah. Then uh, another time I heard him, well, after that, after the meeting, I got talked to him. He was telling about this bunch of horses he brought down. He was working for a fellow up there. Yeah. And he came down with the horses. So, and he stayed with the horses there at Fort Reno and went, they took them to uh, New Jersey, come or Somewhere up yeah, there in New England. Yeah. And he went with them up there and with a colored outfit that got him. And yeah. <laughs> he told him this uh, little, uh, so he's kind of paunchy yeah. uh, Negro yeah. sergeant coming yeah. down there to take charge of him. He turned yeah. him over to him. Yeah. He's kind of paunchy for yeah. a cavalryman. Yeah. And then just about a year later, he uh, took another bunch back up there. Yeah. And see that Negro sergeant there. Winston says it was them horses, Jim. Oh, he said, yes, sir. <laughs> he says, well, that's what you told me. <laughs> it was about that last bunch. He says, we still got them in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> got them in the hospital yet, yeah, or you're dead right. They weren't dead. They were showing up outlaws. They was outlaws. Why, they sure. They were getting out of strings up there in Montana. Yeah. Why, <laughs> sure. They do that to get rid of them. Uh -huh. They done that, and then Fort Reno got them, and then they, they had dumped them off on these other fellows out of there. Uh -huh. That's the way they dumped them off. They were supposed to be broke, but they weren't broke. <laughs> Darn right. Yeah, no, that happened up there. That remount station, boy, that, that is a side show. Any time in the morning you got up and they went out to break horses, you could see some of the pictionist scamps that was turned loose. And they, they, was, they was bucking stuff. They wasn't no just halfway stuff. <laughs> they didn't know when to quit. In space of that northern bunch of horses, Montana and out in there, you know, from mm -hmm. Montana and Idaho and out there. Oh, uh, Oregon. Yeah. What about them uh, 
Did you ever, was you around when they were still issuing uh, beef at that barn in the ancient I answered, I answered, no, I didn't go over an issue over there at Darlington. No, I, I issued to the soldiers at Fort Reno. And I issued there, uh, John Sands was the fellow that had the contract. And he sent me up there to, to do the issuing of the meat out there to the soldiers, you see. They had a uh, uh, shop there. You probably, probably know we have heard or even around the public. When the Indians, they come in once a month or something, didn't they, to the darling for days so they could pick up their base? Yeah, and they, issued their they would. Campaign. Yeah, they would do that. They come in, the government issued meat to them. They butchered it right on the spot. They yeah, they, they butchered it. And they were in particular just cattle cows or anything. And it was fat stuff like you'd buy. It was just anything that they'd get that way. They'd kill it and chop it up for them. Let them have it. I turn in over here at, uh, at Oklahoma City, they had a fellow by the name of Spurlock. He had a kind of a little old rodeo outfit of his own out there. And he had advertised, you know, if they would kill a beef, the, the Indians would kill a beef, you know, like they did the old style, you know, with the bow and arrow, and uh, butchered out there for the public to see how to handle it. And when they got down there, they wouldn't let them use the bow and arrow. And uh, they wondered how they was going to get to kill it. And so, uh, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of the old boy's name up here. Dar I'm not darling in the middle of uh, Watonga. Greenfield, up there, Greenfield. I can't think of his name, no Indian up there. He told them he was with them. And he he come around and told the outfit there says we we got a man here kill the bee first you let him let him shoot it and well they agreed to that because that way there was no wild shots fired and nothing you know so they had me I was the one they picked and uh, so I went out they turned him out of the pen they wanted to know if I wanted to rope on him I said no just turn him loose. And that made it appear nicer to the crowd to watch him, you know, to see the way that, when that had turned out, they had a running, you know, and the shoots were running. And they turned it out, and I had a raise back of him, quite a little raise at the tail back there, a long ways down in the bottom. And I know that was, everything was clear, and, and so when they turned him out, he broke the run right away, of course. And I got him just the first shot, you know, because I was used to it. And I planted it right in the butt of his ear. And when uh, they went up and stuck him, I let the Indians do it all and lie for it. Mm. They stuck him and they drank that blood and, and went ahead and butchered it out there. The squaws did. The bucks didn't do nothing. The squaws done all the work. They butchered that and they taken that liver when they got the liver out opened it up and got the liver out. They cut off chunks and gave to the kids around there, those papoose, that's Indian, mm -hmm. <laughs> those babies. They call them papoose. They're uh, little ones. And they ate that like you would, they would eat candy. Mm -hmm. And that blood raw. on it. Yeah, just the raw red, warm liver. And they just cut them off a big chunk out of it and handed it to him. And boy, he never wasted any of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they butchered that there Spurlock shop that day at Oklahoma City. That, uh, they eat the gut too, didn't they? No, they, they... Or, I mean, they were known to eat them. Well, they claim, they, they claim to, the mar what they call the mar gut in there, that they, they eat. They turn and strip that, clean it, you know, wash it out. And it's just, they, they eat that one. That's about the only one they do. Eat. And the points, they don't throw the points away. They save all that. Roy, I'm going to serve you're getting tired right there. Well, I think so. Yeah, I'll see you right in the yard.